Good morning. Welcome to Pilgrim Congregational United Church of Christ here in Lansing, Michigan, on this, the 19th day of September of the year 2021. We're glad to have you here with us today. In our scripture today, we continue with our reading of the letter of the Apostle James, who cautions us against envy and selfish ambition. He advises us to humble ourselves and draw near to God so we may be gentle and peaceable with each other. And in the gospel lesson, Jesus tells, us, uh, tells the disciples and us that he will be betrayed, killed, and risen again. And then he confronts the disciples who are arguing over who is the greatest among them. And he says that the greatest is the servant of all. Well, we will humbly look at how these scriptures apply to us today. And now, may God bless our time together. Morning, all. Good to see everybody here today. Uh, some of announcements for Pilgrim Church on this Sunday, September 19. Uh, there is an insert in your bulletin. Looks like this. And it lists safety guidelines for our worship service. Uh, everybody has been doing a really wonderful job following those guidelines. Uh, keep it up. Let's keep everybody healthy and safe while they're at church. The reopening committee made recommendations to the executive ministry team and the EMT has decided for us to continue meeting for worship as we are for now. Uh, we are considering a drive-in service for mid-October. Uh, currently we're thinking about October 17th. But remember that we are continuing also to record and post all of our worship services online. For your information, we have hired Jay Wieses as the financial administrator for Pilgrim Church. Uh, Jay started this past Wednesday and Cheryl Knott is training him. Um, Jay was selected from a large number of applicants for that position. Uh, he is currently fulfilling that position for both Pilgrim and United Methodist Church, if I remember correctly, uh, here in Lansing. So he has experience in dealing with that, and we welcome Jay. Uh, there aren't enough people or enough hands here right now to say thank you for all the service that Cheryl has brought to Pilgrim Church these past years as treasurer. Cheryl will remain as treasurer, but uh, some of the heavy lifting is going to be handled by Jay. Uh, also, Pastor Peter will be leading a brief worship service called Vespers at Bircham Hills this afternoon at 4 o'clock, and visitors are welcome to attend. And the executive minister team thanks everyone who has continued to give offerings and contributions to Pilgrim Church. Many of you have responded <clears throat> to the special plea from Christian Services for personal needs items, and we are grateful for your donations. Thank you. This will be the last Sunday we will be collecting, and we will be delivering these items this week to All Nations Church. Our mobile fellowship has done another round of visits to our members and friends, and we will now be taking a break before starting up again. We want to thank the people who were regular in going on the visitations, and we especially thank moderator Karen Davis for her work in organizing most of our visits. Next Saturday, September 25th, Pilgrim's oldest member, Leona Rippon, will be 99 years old. Let's send her some birthday cards. You can get the address from the church office if you don't have it. Next Sunday, please also join us for a fellowship time at 11.30 on Zoom. The link will be sent out by email either Thursday or Friday this week. If you do not have a computer or smartphone, Try to find someone who does and join in the fellowship. Those are the announcements for Pilgrim Church today. Now, let us begin our worship with the prayer of invocation. Let us pray. Dear God, we have come to learn from you and to draw closer to you. May our spirits connect with your spirit and be guided to a greater understanding of your will 
and your ways. We have not come to seek power over people, but rather we want to know your presence. Help us to cast out our desire to be honored, praised, and to be set above others. We want to be transformed by the power of your love. So we begin by being humble and learning the ways of serving others. May our works be done in gentleness born of wisdom. Help us to be wise in your ways. Amen. The next song, uh, What Does the Lord Ask of Me, is a song written by Randy Roy, which was inspired by Micah 6.8, which says, God has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. What does the Lord ask of me to live a life seeking justice and help the lost soul see? Where there is darkness, shine the light of equity. That's what the Lord asks of me. What does the Lord ask of me but to live a life of kindness toward others that I see? Spend more time helping others and less time helping me. That's what the Lord asks of me. I will walk in the shadow of the Lord who has shown me the way. I will reflect the light of the chosen one. That's what the Lord asks of me. What does the Lord ask of me? To walk humbly in his presence every day that I am free. Shine his light for others, not just for me. That's what the Lord asks of me. I will walk in the shadow of the Lord who has shown me the way. I will reflect the light of the chosen one. That's what the Lord asks of. That's what the Lord asks of. That's what the Lord asks of me. Please join me in the call to worship that's printed in your bulletin. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. We gather to become aware of God's presence, who is as close as our breath. Be humble in God's presence, for God alone is great. Our greatness is in serving God and one another. Our first hymn was written by Washington Gladden, a congregational minister, in 1879. The song expresses our desire to walk with God and to serve God faithfully. And part of that faithful service is to win over people to God by love. O oh, Savior, let me walk with you. Teach me your 
through 4, 3, and 7 through 8a. The Apostle James wrote a letter urging the followers of Jesus to keep faith, to make sure that faith leads you to do good works, and to live in peace with one another. The way to peace within and outside is to get close to God and remain humble. This is the letter of James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder, and you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Humble yourself before the Lord, and God will exalt you. This concludes our first scripture reading. Let us pray together. Dear God, you call upon us to walk humbly with you. We, we wish, wish to come nearer to you, so we ask you to direct our course in life and give us the courage to be honest with ourselves and with you. May we be freed from the desire to rule over others and to be seen as better than other people. Help us to overcome our desire to be praised and honored May we be free from the fear that others may be loved more than we are. Help us to overcome our fear of being criticized and ridiculed. May we be free from the fear of being humiliated and rejected. We praise you and honor you, God. We thank you for your love, which helps us to overcome our fears. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, Mel, do you remember ever seeing top ten lists? Oh, I sure do. I used to listen to the top ten countdown on the radio. There are so many others, like the top 10 places to visit in Michigan, or the top 10 
football teams. I think there is a top 10 list for just about everything. Yeah, I was thinking about what would go on a top 10 list for reasons to go to church. Well, what would you put on that list? Well, let's do the countdown. The top 10 reasons for going to church. Reason number 10, there are chocolate donuts every Sunday. <laughs> That's not true. You can't put that on your list. We aren't even having fellowship time because of COVID. You're right, but someday when COVID is under control, we can get together after church and enjoy yummy snacks and good conversations at fellowship time. Let me try one. There is live music and you get to sing together praises to God. Oh, good one. Well, not only that, but on the countdown, reason number eight to come to church. We get to pray for each other. It's powerful to be together in prayer. You can learn from the Bible. The scripture lessons we hear during church service tell us wonderful stories and give us guidance how to live our daily lives. Reason number six, you can make long lasting friendships. Some of the people I have met at church in Sunday school, activities, teams, and worship have become very close friends throughout the years. You know, I think that would go along with reason number five, to go to church. You can receive encouragement from others and you can give encouragement to others. We are all children of God and we can support each other in our faith journeys. How about reason number four? You can hear a good sermon by Pastor Peter. He helps you to understand how to follow God, what God wants us to do, what the scriptures mean, and what it means to be Christian. All of this leads to reason number three for coming to church. When you come to church, you grow in your faith. Everyone from the youngest child to the oldest adult can grow in their faith. Reason number two, when you miss coming to church service, it makes it easier to mix the next week and the next week. You know, Mel, we've all had this problem with the pandemic. We are out of practice of coming to church. We've gotten used to watching services online. It was important to gather together, even though we had to do it virtually. Well, we have only opened back up in-person services recently. Some people are not comfortable gathering in person now, and we have service online for them. We hope soon that the number of COVID cases will go down and we will be out of this pandemic. Until then, we need to respect everyone's feelings and decisions. We need, still need to follow the safety precautions that have been put in place to keep the in-person worship safe. It will be wonderful when we can all truly be together again. And finally, the number one reason for coming to church, if you are not in church, you are sure to miss out on something God has planned for you. In the Bible, Jesus told the disciples that whenever two or three are gathered in his name, he would be there with them. Each week we come together in the name of Jesus to worship and to praise him. If we don't come to church, we miss out on the chance to be with Jesus. Well, let's pray. Dear Lord, we have gathered in this house or online today because we want to be with you. We have come to worship and praise your name. Amen. <coughs> The God of all creation hears our cries and God calls us to service and we respond, here I am Lord, send me.
hearts of stone. Give them hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord. If you lesson, Jesus predicts his death and resurrection a second time. Then Jesus confronts the disciples about arguing who among them is the greatest. Jesus turns the social order on its head by saying that the one who serves others is the greatest. To further make his point, Jesus equates the importance of a child to his own significance. This is a radical idea because in Jesus' society, children were little better than slaves. This is Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the 12, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Thanks be to God for the gospel reading. Amen. Let us pray. Bless our hearing of your word, God. Open our hearts and minds to know your will and the courage to do it. Amen. The gospel lesson begins with Jesus and his disciples heading back to their home base at Capernaum. Uh, along the way, Jesus was teaching them about his fate of being betrayed and killed and then rising again. But 
the disciples are interested in a different subject and they are arguing among themselves. When they get home, Jesus asks them, what were they arguing about? And he is met with embarrassed silence. Like children caught with their hand in the cookie jar, they know they've done something wrong. They've been caught doing something wrong. Jesus knows that the disciples were arguing among themselves as to which one of them was the greatest. Let me ask you a question. What makes someone great? We've all heard about, read about, many of us have even known some great people. Why are they great? Well, it seems that the disciples had a common understanding of what makes someone great. They had a very worldly definition of greatness which is based on the recognition and honor other people give to someone. Greatness comes with how many people recognize who you are and how much they, have, uh, how much they hold you into high esteem. Greatness means that the person is considered superior to other people, at least in a particular area of ability or accomplishment. And therefore, the person is more important than other people. Greatness usually gets bestowed on someone because they did something great. They did it better than other people did, or longer than other people did, or they did it under very unusual and difficult circumstances. Greatness is most often given to people who go above and beyond other people's expectations. So, greatness is the state of being great. What are some things that make people great? Many athletes are considered great because they outperform most people in whatever competition they do. Jesse Owens was great because he was faster and more skilled at running than other people. He won four gold medals at the 1936 Olympics in track and field competitions, among other accomplishments. Some entertainers are considered great because of how well they did what they did and how many people liked what they did as they performed on stage or acted in movies, sang or played an instrument. Frank Sinatra, Nat King Cole, they were great singers. Jack Nicholson, Denzel Washington, they're great actors. Some scientists are great for the information they provided. We all know Albert Einstein. And most of us have heard of Stephen Hawking. But quite often we think of military and political leaders when we think of greatness. We think, you know, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln. Maybe we think about Winston Churchill or Dwight Eisenhower. But there have been leaders with the title great who were ruthless and violent, such as Alexander the Great, Ramesses the Second, Herod the Great, and Caesar Augustus, all of these and more were considered great because of the great power they used to conquer people and to rule over them. This is part of the greatness that the disciples, I think, were talking about. Previous to our gospel passage, Jesus has already accepted the title of Messiah for himself. You see, the disciples, like most Jews of their day, believed that the Messiah would be a Jew who would lead an army of soldiers to militarily push the Romans out of their country. And then, after reconquering the Holy Land, the Messiah would become king of Israel and rule the nation with peace and prosperity. This is what Jews thought the job description of the Messiah was. A military leader, and then, then a king. This is most likely what the disciples had in mind when they continued to follow Jesus. They expected Jesus to gather an army, lead it to victory, and then become king of Israel. And they would be right there with him all the way to the throne room to share in his glory and his wealth by being the king's closest companions. The disciples expected to become worldly famous, powerful, and rich, by hanging on to the coattails of Jesus, so to speak. People who want to be worldly successful 
seek recognition, power, and wealth for themselves. Recognition, power, and wealth are the measure of success for people who live for themselves and strive for what the world has to offer to bring them security and comfort. So the disciples were imagining themselves being worldly successful, getting all the pleasure and perks of life by following Jesus. Oh, things were rough for them at the present, yes, but Jesus would be their ticket to a bright future. The disciples were focused on the creature comforts of the world and not on heaven's benefits. And with that in mind, the disciples began arguing with themselves about who was the greatest among them. Much of their argument was probably about who among them Jesus liked best. So I ask again, what makes someone great? Now at this point in time, the disciples are like so many people, perhaps most people. They believe greatness is found in the recognition of other people, the amount of power one has, and the amount of wealth a person owns. Well, Jesus decides to give an object lesson of greatness. And he starts out by telling them something bizarre. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and the servant of all. Jesus has just turned the social order upside down. For most people, being first means being superior. And isn't that what we all work for? Get ahead, be superior, so we can be first? Imagine you are at a table being served. Being first means you get the good food, and you get more of the good stuff. The one who, uh, who's last gets all the stuff that nobody else wanted, and even the food may run out before you get anything. How many of us have been that to uh, one of our potluck dinners here, huh? And all of a sudden the good stuff's gone by the time you get there. Yeah? Who wants to be a servant? Don't we want to be the one who has served? Being a servant is like being last. It's, you get rejects, you get leftovers, or nothing at all. But Jesus says that being last and a servant of everyone else is greatness. Now, isn't that just bizarre? But Jesus is not done being bizarre. Next, he takes a child and places that child where everyone can see. And then he embraces that child and tells them, whoever welcomes, the uh, welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This move is bizarre for the disciples because a child was seen having the same worth as a slave. That is how children were treated, like slaves. Children did not have any intrinsic value. Their worth is in how they serve. A rabbi like Jesus especially would not bother with children. They were totally unimportant. But Jesus places the utmost importance to children. Jesus equates welcoming a child the same as welcoming him. And when you welcome Jesus, you, you are also welcoming God. Once again, Jesus just flipped the social order upside down. So the question we ask now is, what does Jesus think makes someone great? Well, what did Jesus do to be great? Now, Jesus shocks his disciples at the Last Supper by washing their feet. Washing other people's feet was a task that was only fit for a slave to do. Yet Jesus is their master. Jesus demonstrated in a profound way that serving the needs of other people, being a servant to others, is the greatest thing you can do. And he demonstrated that in an even more profound way. That he was the servant of all by dying on the cross. Could have avoided it. He could have escaped it, but he chose to do what was best for humanity and suffered torture and death for us. 
so we could have a way of being forgiven by God and reconciled with God. It seems that Jesus thinks someone is great by caring about other people. Greatness comes to a person who sees another person in need and tries to help that person fill that need. When one person serves another person in need, we call that person a servant. Jesus said that the greatest among you is the servant of all. So it seems that caring for others, filling their needs, healing their wounds, showing them love is what makes a person great. For Jesus, showing power over other people by putting them down, taking more for yourself than others have, seeking to make yourself recognized as great does not make someone great. It is just the opposite. Being truly great means advancing the well-being of everyone, not just your own well-being. And I've asked you this before and I ask you again, would you do good in the world if you thought no one would know what you did? And if someone else would even get the credit. Greatness is doing good and great things without seeking to be great. Because the purpose of doing good is to do good. Greatness is not in showing you have power over others, but in giving others powers that they did not have. Because the purpose of power is to help others. Greatness is not in accumulating wealth while others become poor. Greatness is in giving your, out of your abundance to those who don't have any, and the purpose of giving it is only because other people need it. True greatness is for those who care about other people and do not care if they ever get recognized or powerful or wealthy because of it. What makes someone great? Caring and loving other people is what makes you great. Amen. Now let us pray. We come before you, God, in all humility to seek your counsel and blessing. We wish to be near you and to follow you faithfully. We seek to be wise and understanding so we may learn your ways and that your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know that we have been foolish in seeking the adoration and honor of others. Help us find the strength and integrity to not need these things and to give praise to you, God, and to others. May we be your devoted and dedicated servants. God. May we look to the needs of others and bring them a helping hand and a caring heart. Help us to cleanse ourselves of bitter envy and selfish ambition. May our ambition always be to serve you faithfully and well. We seek peace and reconciliation for ourselves and all people. And to that end, we pray for people to overcome their differences and divisions and to come together in mutual respect and caring. May we solve our problems without violence or inhumanity. We lift up for your loving consideration and our genuine concern, the victims of the natural violence of earthquakes, floods, fires, and hurricanes. Bring them healing and comfort. God, please bring healing to those who are sick and injured. Please bring your healing power upon them according to your will. Protect our dedicated first responders, especially our health care workers. Protect our children and teachers. Protect us all, but give us also the consideration and wisdom to keep the spread of disease to a minimum. For the grieving, surround them with love so that they may feel the comfort and strength of your presence with them in their pain and loss. Now, dear God, we pray together in unity of voice and spirit our Lord's Prayer. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus said that the greatest among us is the servant of all. We are all on this journey of life, and we are here to help each other. We are all bound together in Christ's love. So, won't you let me be your servant? The Apostle James says, get near to God and God will get near to you. Humble yourself and God will exalt you. Have the courage and strength to be humble. Being humble is necessary to get close to God and it is the right attitude to live and work among others. You were created by God to be a part of this world, sharing in its burdens and its delights. So as far as possible, be at peace with one another and help each other to grow closer to God. Show the love of God in your good works. And let your good deeds be for God's glory and not your own. And you will find internal and external peace. God bless you all. Amen. Just a reminder about our guidelines. Please wipe down the place where you're sitting with the sanitizing wipes that are in your pew. And if you, because we've noticed some, some people use the edge of the pew to, to help them get, get out. Um, if you're doing that, if you put the sanitation wipe in your hand as you touch the pews, then we will have that little problem taken care of quickly. Please leave from the back to the front and then outside the sanctuary side door the baskets for your offerings, recycling, and trash, then please take your conversations outside the building. Stay safe. God bless you all. <laughs>